has something to do with, with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So in my childhood, I enjoyed the local IT club a lot, so much that on one of the Saturday mornings, I went with my father to the local market, and we bought the cheapest affordable PC, <laughs> which was a PC made in Ukraine. So it was this one, it was called Pipe. <laughs> It had no, uh, it had no storage. <laughs> so the next step, uh, the next duty was to buy an uh, audio cassette recorder and player, so that we have something to uh, store our programs. And the next step was to find uh, a skilled electrician, and that electrician we asked to make this adapter, so that we can, <laughs> so that we can mount the PC to to, to our home TV. In the first month, all I did is we just played games and we just exchanged games uh, with our fellow boys. And after that, I started my real IT career. And after that, uh, so this this was a foundation. This served as a foundation for me for becoming a, a real professional. So thank you, Ukraine, for providing this uh, beautiful machine. <laughs> So I firmly believe that code always be written in a much better way. Um, and uh, in my presentation, I'm going to present you three ways how we can write better code. I'm going to show you the dry transaction, the monad do notation, and the trailblazer operations. And I'm going to compare how how it would um, what, what are the benefits um, compared to the classic uh, if jungler solution. So. Let's check this code. This is a code from a registration use case where the user registers itself in any system. So first we are creating the user. If the user is valid, we are creating the packet, package he opted for. If the package is valid, then we are sending some messages. So this is the, um, the, the schema. What if any of the manager says that let's add some discount to it? So here, the, the cyclomatic complexity is two. If any of the manager asks to add some discounts based on some coupons, then we are checking if for the existence of any coupon, and based on that coupon, we are creating some discount and we are attaching to the user. Immediately, the cyclomatic complexity raises to four. But what if uh, any of the manager or somebody from the product team comes and says that, hey, let's not add a discount for any user. Let's just add discount for it. only those users who are eligible, who are, who are located in certain geographic locations. Um, at that point, immediately the cyclomatic complexity raises from four to five by adding one more conditional, and the story never ends. It doesn't stop here. <laughs> so the whole story could continue infinitely, and usually it does because the product team usually is much faster than letting the developers to have some time to refactor this code. So, I'm going to show you some tools how to um, eliminate all these conditionals in your code. And the way I'm going to uh, show you is that I'm going to show you uh, a linear function, an implementation of a linear function in four different ways. So the first way is uh, the classic if jungle. If we decompose the linear function into, an, into the first component, an addition, um, then I'm going to show you through TDD, which is test driven development. So we are writing the specs for the addition. We are going to write a negative test, meaning that what would happen if we inject an infinite number? So we have the number 1, we divide it by 0, that's an infinite number. We call the operation with the infinite number, and in return we expect an error message. There is the error message, so we implement it by, if any of the parameters is infinite, then we are, we are returning just an error message. The positive case is simple, because we expect to sum all these numbers, and the implementation is we continue our code with summing all these numbers. The same would be the implementation. So don't forget that we are heading toward the linear uh, implementation of the linear function. 
the next step for the linear function would be the multiplication operation. I'm not going to show it because it would be boring. So now I'm going to show you the whole linear function. So this is the linear function. In the linear function, we call the multiply operation. If the result is a result, then we call the out operation by passing the outcome of the first operation. Or in case it's a re an error, we return the error. So it's simple. But, um, but we have two conditioners, which worries me a lot. Uh, let me summarize what happened here. So in a linear function, we have two operations, the other multiply, both of them having a guard condition and a business logic. And in the linear function, we have delegation and if conditional. And based in one of the branches of the condition, we have a delegation. And on the other branch of the condition, we, we just return an error. So what worries me is the presence of the condition. That's always a huge yellow lamp for me. Because as, we, as I showed in the earlier um, slide, where we had that user registration use case, the number of conditions could increase, increase, increase very rapidly. And it could make the code unreadable. So it's always a good idea to somehow get rid of that. So the first library I'm going to show you how to get rid of that will be dry transactions. So it's the same spec. It's the same negative spec I showed you earlier. Expect that I change the uh, subject. I change the subject to dry transaction. We, we have the number one divided by zero. That's an infinite number. We call the operation the infinite number. And as we turn, we, um, we expect a failure message. The implementation is the following. We have two steps. We have the validation steps and we have the audition steps. So explicitly, we show what's going to happen. And uh, that's the beauty of this syntax. And here, using a real world metaphor, this also translates to a so-called railway oriented development, meaning that the execution starts in a lane, and if any of the steps fails to be executed, then the execution immediately deviates to the, to the error lane. Otherwise, and as a consequence, the next subsequent steps won't be executed at all. If the first step is executed properly, then the execution continues in that lane, and we go forward and forward with the processing. So in our case, if the validation fails, then the audition um, step is not executed at all. If the validate succeeds, then the audition continues on the success lane. So how we do that? We have a validate method. Unless all the numbers are finite, then we return a failure, otherwise success. In the audition, uh, we just sum the numbers together and return the number as a success. So um, the exact same implementation we would, would be for the multiply operation. And don't forget that we are heading toward implementing the linear function. So here is the implementation of the linear function. We decompose the mathematical formula exactly as it is into steps. So the first step is the multiply step. The second is assembling all the parts together. So the multiply step, in the multiply step, we call the multi multiply operation. And um, the convention is that they return um, um, a result monad. And if the result monad is success, then the code block is going to execute it. If you look where the arrow is, so if the result monad is success, then the code block is executed. And that's how we inject the outcome of the multiply operation into the success monad. If the outcome of the multiply operation is failure, then the code is not being executed, and the failure monad is, uh, is going to be returned. And that's how the execution is going to be deviated into the failure lane. So if, if it's success, then the next method is going to be called in the next method, we are going to grab the outcome of the first operation and call the addition. And since we are doing uh, test-driven development, all of our specs are uh, succeeding. So all of our seven examples are succeeding. So what's the um, structure? We have 
the two operations like we did like, like we have before then we start with the guard step and the business logic step in the linear function we have a multiply step and an assembler step exactly uh, one to one mapping to a mathematical formula and as a note i would like to mention here that we have no condition at all compared to the if solution to the if jungle solution we have no 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 condition which is a huge benefit plus again we have another benefit that um, there is a linear execution of, step, of uh, explicitly stated steps and that's important because everybody can read the main important business steps what's going on in the code the second library i'm going to uh, show the linear functions is monad do notation so here the uh, code for the negative test. I change the subject to the monad do notation. We inject the infinite number and we expect an error message. In the monad do notation, we include all these mixings into our class. We have a call parameter, a uh, call method. The call method um, calls the validate function, and we and the validate method returns a result monad. That result monad is yielded back to the dry monad tool mixing. That mixing checks uh, checks the uh, value of the re uh, result monad. If if it's success, then it calls the next uh, the next Ruby um, call, which is uh, the yield add. Otherwise, it stops the execution. And uh, the same for the add. So. The, in, in the validate, unless all, the, all of our inputs are finite, then we return a failure monad. Otherwise, we return a success. And in the addition, we just sum the numbers together and return the summed number as a success. <coughs> so the same would be the, for the multiply operation. But uh, I'm not going to present that here. So what we have here is the linear operation itself. We have included all the um, dry monads do notation mixing in our class. We have the core method, and um, we call the multiplication operation. We yield it uh, by wrapping to the monad do notation, and we call the add operation with the result coming from the previous operation. And um, that's it. How it's implemented. So in the multiply method, we delegate to the multiply operation, which we, which I showed you earlier. In the add uh, operation, um, we delegate to the add operation. So the structure again is very similar to what we had previously. We had two operations, both of them having a validate method and a business logic method. In the linear function, we have a multiply method and an odd method. And there is no conditional compared to the Jungle solution, so the code seems linear. And what's important compared to the uh, dry transaction is that we have just few Ruby calls wrapped by yield, and that yield uh, yields the result back to the monad do notation, which checks if the result is success or failure, and that's how the execution is going to remain on the success lane or deviate to the failure lane. The third library is the Trailblazer operations, which is uh, <laughs> who's orchestrated by Nick, who's a friend of mine, and uh, <laughs> who has uh, some uh, experience with Trailblazer. Please raise your hands. Okay, nice. I love it. So here again we have the specs. Uh, all I did is I changed the subject to the trailblazer operation. We divide the number one by zero. That's an infinite number. Um, we call the operation with the infinite number, and we expect an error message. And this this is the implementation, the definition. We have two steps explicitly stated, like in case of the dry transactions, and the implement. So again. Uh, here the uh, railway oriented approach comes in so it's a real world metaphor uh, showing how the code should work should work like 
if the validation fails, then the next step, the add step, won't be executed. Otherwise, the execution proceeds forward toward the add method. And the code, the code is simple. <coughs> Unless all the parameters are finite, we inject um, an error message. And with the railway.fail method, we deviate the execution from the success name to the error name. Otherwise, the, key, the execution on the on the success lane. The other operation is simple because we are summing all the numbers together. So this was the implementation of the add method. The implementation of the multiply method would be exactly the same. So I'm not going to show it here. <laughs> but since we are headed toward the linear, uh, as to the implementation of the linear um, function, so we have the linear function, the implementation for the linear function. We decompose the um, mathematical operations from the linear function into one by one uh, representation of calling operations. So we have steps, two steps. We are, going, we, are, we are calling the multiply operation nested inside the linear function. And after that, we are calling the multiply, no, the add operation uh, nested inside the linear function. And um, that's it. So we have no conditioners here to check for the parameters, and all of our um, specs are succeeding. And voila. So the structure is the following. We have again two operations, all of them having validate steps and business logic steps. In the linear function, we have one by one mapping of the uh, mathematical formula. And as a side note, which, which is very important, no conditions compared with compared to the each angle solution. All the steps are explicitly stated linear steps, which are easy to read by each, each of the developer. And we have a DSL for using the operations. So if I would compare the three solutions, I would say that the dry transaction and trailblazer both have syntax for defining the steps one by one, and, and the code reuse for the for the, dry, for the dry transaction and for the monad do notation is simple rubicol. And in the monad do notation, we yield the result to the monad do notation mixing, thus decides if the execution stays on the success lane or on the error lane. And in Trailblazer, we have a DSL for code reuse. So this would be, um, in short, the summary. And do you remember in our first slides we had the huge if solution, the huge registration uh, code, the huge uh, uh, if jungle with the cyclomatic complexity of five. So I would say that using these techniques I showed you earlier, we can replace all this code by something like this. So I think this is a much nicer solution. So we have to persist the user. We have to persist the package. We have to add a coupon based discount. And we have to notify the registration. And that's it. What if one of our, um, somebody from the, let's say the CTO says that, OK, but we need to debug the code. We need to know where the, um, where the execution failed. In that case, we add some logging so that Anybody can read the logs and decide and check where the execution was. So instead of forcing a, a junior developer to, <laughs> to decipher our if jungle and put the logging into proper places, we ask the junior developer to put the failure steps into our code. And that's how we have a logging. And what if, it, if somebody from the product team comes and says that, um, we, after notifying about the registration, we, maybe it would be a, bad, a good idea to notify, to send a notification for, for the registered users, Facebook friends, so even they can register themselves into the system. So that's again easy, because we are not forcing anybody to uh, find the proper place in the each and put a call there, we are just adding another step. And I think that this is the real benefit of the railway-oriented development. 
that we have a linear execution steps explicitly stated, which are easy to read and easy to follow. And the cyclomatic complexity is just below one or two, maybe, not more. And my, my, my personal best practice using this technique is the following. Use trailblazer operation for con with contracts. And I'm, I'm writing um, trailblazer operations for, uh, for the crude method, for the, the create, read, update, and delete. And I'm using those crude methods for all the entities in the system, no matter if we have 10 entities or 50 entities in the system. And Trailblazer is flexible enough to let us uh, inject parameters into the operations from the outside, meaning that if any entity has um, different validation rules, that those validation rules are injected from the outside in form of uh, reform or contracts. And uh, that's how I'm reusing the crude, the basic four crude operations. And I'm reusing those crude operations, admin operation, or onboarding, or registration operation, or any other operation which is, um, which is, uh, which is handling other business use cases. So using this technique, the whole development is like uh, playing with reusable Lego blocks, and it's simple. So I, I love I like this structure, and I, I think that <laughs> we all know that sometimes our, our our life is a huge mess like this, and I really hope that if, uh, the, the techniques which, which I show you, uh, our life became a linear like any normal man's life, like in the uh, above uh, figure. Or I really hope that <laughs> this is not going to happen at 10, 10 p.m. In the, in the night. And I also think that nobody would like to commit suicide and nobody will um, save other fellow programmers life by solving his bug. <laughs> and uh, even if we were not born rich and cute, I think that we'll have a long and prosperous life. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. 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 Th
and bind together into APIs, into robust APIs with reusable components. And um, I've used this for, so for one and a half year in production, in hobby by more than two years, and in multiple projects in production, and they are robust enough so that everybody so, was so pleased that, uh, that the architecture was uh, really welcome. So, I mean, I have experience only with three years of operation and the contracts, but they serve really well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, very interesting topic. Uh, I want to ask uh, about um, the Astral Blazers they sell provide, uh, for example, example, SQL transactions. What happens when on the third step something failed and I should roll back first, uh, in first, in first, cycle first and second? Yeah. If you need special transactions with, with, with uh, special, special isolation levels, which um, which deviates from the uh, def from the uh, from the default one provided by Ruby or or uh, the default one provided by Hanami or any other uh, framework, then uh, it's the best to write your own transaction isolation level in a step, and inside that step, call the other operations which are inside. So that way you are keeping in your hand the transaction resolution level. And uh, especially in fintech projects, this is really important for any other projects where it's not just a game. Okay, so okay. Uh, one more. As far as I remember, on Ruby Meditation 35 or something like that, we have a, a uh, one of the topic was about dry validations and dry topics, uh, dry types. Uh, and we have uh, mostly, uh, as far as I remember, one of the questions was if you have validation step by step. So, uh, and uh, will be if user friendly to the user return error step by step like that. And the uh, other question what regarding to this structure, yeah, so what if we could use some uh, patterns like null patterns or something like that to fix this I uh, issue with if else, if else, if else, or something. Mm other structure things. I think that all the other structures are welcome and those other structures would, would serve as a basement for other presentations and other ideas and personally I would like to see those solutions as well and um, yes in contracts I'm not using the uh, active model um, validations which are coming from the active record rather I use the dry validation with dry types and uh, even I make dependencies on each other, and that's how I can group them. And by grouping them, I um, provide the user interface, some group of errors which comes in a all together. Right. Any other questions? No? Right, thank you. Thank you. Bye.